You're listening to The Table, a podcast series from students at Christian Theological Seminary. Pull up a seat. There is a space at the table for everyone. Hello, I am Terea Harris, your host for this episode of The Table. I am a dual degree student at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I'm pursuing degrees in divinity and clinical mental health counseling. I look forward to combining my passions for education, mental health, and faith by inviting folk to the table for nourishing conversations that affirm marginalized identities while challenging systems of oppression. During today's episode, we'll be exploring divine positioning, purpose, and power through John's account of Jesus feeding over 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And this account can be found in the first section of John in chapter 6. So the backdrop of our conversation today is John's account of Jesus feeding the multitudes. And this account is found in John chapter 6, verses 1 through about 15. However, for the purpose of our conversation, we will focus on verse 8, which reads, Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? I once heard someone preach this message, and they mentioned the young boy in the crowd being close enough to be acknowledged by church leaders. The pastor's point in this particular message was that young people need to position themselves in close proximity to church leaders in order to be discipled or taught. And in this message, the pastor was putting the responsibility of being discipled, of being taught, of having their gifts used and their and their gifts seen and used, I should say, he put that responsibility on the young people. And for this conversation, we'll refer to young people as either young in age or young in ministry experience. And as I sat in the pew listening to this message, I began to think about how I'm a young person in ministry who is even on the church staff, yet I still feel unseen. What was I doing wrong? Was I doing anything wrong? Was I not being enough of something? And I began to question the premise of his message of the responsibility being on young people to position themselves in close proximity to church leadership. And so I looked to this passage um, to, to find out what this passage has to say about positioning, purpose, and power. I have invited Reverend D.D. Gray to join me in this conversation. Reverend D.D. Gray is a recent graduate of Christian Theological Seminary, where she earned her Master of Divinity with concentrations in African-American Biblical Interpretation and Womanist Theology. Reverend Gray was licensed and ordained in the gospel ministry under the senior pastoral leadership of Eastern Star Church. She is also the founder and visionary of Kingdom Solution, LLC, which is a multimedia agency that provides consultation and support services to churches and to faith-based organizations. Reverend Gray is a woman of God, a dynamic woman of God, as evidenced by her servant leadership and her faithfulness to her call. 
So welcome, Reverend Dee Dee Gray, to this episode of The Table. Most people are familiar with the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitudes. And for our conversation, I want to focus on two central characters of the story who are often not talked about, Andrew and the young boy. This miracle is well known, yet we tend to focus only on the miracle itself and not the people God put in place or positioned so that the miracle was fulfilled. Andrew and the boy are critical characters in this story. Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples, spots the young boy, and he sees the potentiality of the resources he possesses to be a blessing to the multitude. It's not surprising to me that Andrew gets looked over in this passage, some may consider Andrew a more low-key disciple. Andrew was a fisherman by trade and culturally would have been perceived as unclean, yet he finds himself among Jesus's 12 chosen disciples. And although Andrew is a disciple, he doesn't get the same airtime, if you will, as his fellow disciples like Peter, John, or James. And so, and we find this is evident by um, Andrew only being mentioned by name eight times in the New Testament. And each time he is mentioned, He's identified by his relationship as Peter's brother. And although Andrew may be an unassuming character overall, his role in this passage is integral to the blessing as he was the one who recognized how the boy's resources could be utilized as gifts for the broader community. As Jesus and his disciples found themselves amongst a large crowd, I imagine um, that Andrew, as a church leader in this context, if you will, was actively seeking out resources to be used for God's ultimate glory. So contrary to the sermon I heard, this would place some responsibility on the church leaders to seek out gifts in the people who are proximate, who have positioned themselves, or who have been positioned by God in close proximity. Because while the boy was positioned right in front of Andrew, it took intentionality on Andrew's part in order to recognize how the boy's gifts could be leveraged. So you mentioned the cost of being ordained, of going through the process, of making the sacrifice. And as I think about the boy in this in this passage who had the gifts of the gifts or the resources of the five loaves of bread and two fish, and I I think about the the purpose in that. And as we live out our purpose, and as you talked about cost, I thought of, I think about the vulnerability of being seen and the vulnerability that living in your purpose requires, the vulnerability that is demanded upon the sharing of your gifts. Oh, it's very expensive to be Black to be a black woman and then to be a black woman in ministry, that's layers. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is expensive. What has that been like for you, Dini, as you've been, you know, relatively recently ordained that requires somebody to see your gifts and for you to be vulnerable with them? So what has that experience been like? It's a very, very different journey for women. Um, to ordination and through ordination. Just mm-hmm. even the process is different for us because it's like men, um, the brethren, <laughs> that's intentional. The mm-hmm. brethren, they call themselves. It's a fraternity. Yep. They have been trained almost literally from birth. Mm-hmm. You managing any potential anxiety around your gifts being noticed because... 
that's a real thing and a real experience that you you have these gifts and it's just two fish and five loaves. How is this going to be enough for all these people, right? And so I think that we have those experiences and those thoughts sometimes that I know I have these gifts. I'm sitting with these gifts. I carry these gifts. I am close to close to church leadership with my gifts, but I'm also, I don't know if these two fish and five loaves are. Uh, first of all, I think it was a great passage and you made me revisit it and, and be able to look, as you know, we're, we're CTS seminarians. So you look at everybody in the text. We've learned to look at everybody in the text. And so I appreciate you taking the perspective of the young boy uh, in this passage. Because what, too, I realize he didn't say it wasn't enough. (laughs) The people in the text. Everybody said that except Jesus and the young boy, if I'm not mistaken. But I love what you said. I love, love, love what you said about. The boy didn't question whether what he has had was enough and God made it enough. It's God who uses, it's God who makes our gifts enough for God's purposes. And so even thinking, thinking about that and how we, how we view and conceptualize our purpose in our gifts versus how God uses them. And we just have to be there and available. He's present and available. Mm -hmm. He made it available. Mm -hmm. He was spotted. He was seen. He let them argue and figure all that out of and deal with their own stuff about what was enough or not. Mm -hmm. Because that's what I love about, that's what I love about God too in that text that, You know, it speaks of Andrew, uh, Peter's brother, his older brother, and he was the one who saw the little boy. Mm -hmm. And and, but still question, it still was critical. Right. But that's what I love about God, that even sometimes the most unlikely people, (laughs) God will use to see you. And then you, you just, you're available and used by God, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's even in those circumstances, some of the most unlikely sources and people that can, will see you, you it's undeniable. Yeah, they are. Really quickly, I have one last question for okay. you. Yeah, go ahead. You're fine. Um, as we think about the sermonic presentation of this text that suggests the responsibility of the young boy. I'm curious from your perspective, DC, um, whose responsibility is it for someone's gift to be seen or how might that responsibility be shared? Where do you put the, whose hands do you put the onus in for that? Yes. Yes. And I think even when you look at the text, as you let me reference back to the text, say the text of this, even those who were critical or uh, lacked questioning, faith, if you questioning. Had, you know, questioned, or if you want to take that as a sign, that questioning of a lack of faith or um, it, it required all of that to produce the miracle. It, re, it, it required everybody. To produce the miracle, because even after uh, Christ, then the miracle was performed. It still required people to help pass out the food to all the people, right? Sure. <laughs> yes, yes. It still required everybody to get in where they fit in, mm-hmm. so to be able to not only uh, manifest the miracle, um, but to also experience it. It, mm-hmm. it requires to give that communal spirit and responsibility and everybody playing their role, mm-hmm. even if it's a questionable, questionable one, a critical one, um, or what have you. Um, or again, with the little boy being available, it was still, again, you saw authority uh, and accountability, but most of all, community. 
mm-hmm. um, that play within that text uh, for that to occur. And that's yeah. why, again, um, no, I appreciate the positioning of your question to make us consider and, and think upon that of, again, where I conclude is communal and that it's also vertical and horizontal. It's it's God being present in it and being the source mm-hmm. and then trusting us through horizontal connection uh, and relationship yeah. to, again, for it to then be established in the earth. And I think that's a lot of things we can, a lot of nuggets in there that we can take away and learn from um, that God is still, but he's still uh, performing miracles. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that he can use us, not just one of us, but that miracles require all of us. The collective us. It the collective church. church. The collective church. And I think when we get that, uh, we'll see a lot more miracles, you know, yeah. even, even now. And so I appreciate your your insight um, to that text and challenging us to look at everybody in the text to see them mm-hmm. and where they enter. And that again, um, you know, miracles still happen. And I, I can't, I must reiterate, it takes all of us. I really love that you uplifted this communal sense of responsibility. There's a shared responsibility. And just to close on our good old um, Baptist <laughs> Baptist tradition, as you mentioned, the vertical and the horizontal yes. Yes. and where they meet, if our listeners can envision, it yes. takes the shape of a cross. Cross. Um, yes. And it's with God right there at the center. Um, but it requires, you know, us from the, on the horizontal and on yep. the vertical. So reach we'll end out. with our... <laughs> and reach out. You got to reach, reach up and reach out. Yes, yes. Reach up and reach out. Yeah. Well, Didi, thank you so much. This has been a blessing to me. And um, I pray this conversation has been a blessing to our listeners as well. And, and to me. Yes, to me too. <laughs> I appreciate your insight. I appreciate you for sharing space with us, for making yourself available uh, for your gifts to be seen. So 